Good afternoon. Um, thanks for uh, coming to the session. Fairly decent turnout. I know BCM isn't exactly the most awe-inspiring content that uh, people get to deal with, but it is very important. Um, the number of environments I've seen in my history in IT where customers that we work with in Microsoft don't have decent business continuity plans, either documented or even configured. Uh, to be honest, it's, um, it's just a disaster waiting to happen, quite literally. So I want to just quickly show of hands, how many people actually work with SharePoint deployments and think they have decent BCM right now? Okay, just before we do, so that, ask that question then, how many people work with SharePoint? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Any PFEs in the room? <laughs> okay. So you might learn something today, hopefully. Um, so just to let you know who I am. Um, I'm a product manager now in the, in the SharePoint product group. I am typically the Office 365 product group, as we call ourselves now. My history kind of through IT and uh, kind of my IT career in general is I was a field engineer at Microsoft. I worked for this Computer Science Corporation for a number of years. Um, and I've basically seen all kinds of hideous deployments um, and some good ones, and hopefully... There's some good ones out there. Prior to working in IT, I was a chemist, and I spent about three years plus my university years working in drugs, explosives, and poisons. So difficult questions I can't answer. Just be careful, okay? <laughs> um, I'm fortunate enough to have gone through the Microsoft Certified Master Program, um, and I will point out that obviously there's been a lot of churn in the press recently about that program, and particularly if anyone does have any specific questions, they want answering about where we're going from here. I have been authorized to kind of give you some feedback and talk about that program if any of you are interested in it, but it's a topic for, for uh, after this session. I hail from Manchester in the UK, or as we prefer to call it, the People's Republic of Mancunia. We don't really like to associate ourselves to the rest of England. We're a little bit different. We have a decent football team. <laughs> and my other kind of um, traits, I guess, around me, I have three children. That's not me throwing them up in the air. That's a, that's a bronze statue in, in Oslo. And uh, the other thing in the bottom right -hand corner, as people will attest to, uh, whiskey will get you anything. Yes, I work for the product group. Yes, I know all kinds of secrets and things. And whiskey will get it out of me, usually. <laughs> so if you want to talk about things, you want to talk to me offline, um, you have my email address there and my Twitter account. And I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn and all those things. But the easiest way to get hold of me is definitely email or through whiskey. Anyway. <laughs> so as an agenda, the things we're going to talk about. Based on the show of hands, most of you in this room are in this scenario over on this far side, okay? So the things we're going to talk about in this session, definitions, what does it mean? Sounds like some of you are not quite sure what high availability and DR actually are. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to do a technical a technology overview. So what options do we have? What features? What capabilities? What does SharePoint offer us? What does SQL Server offer us? I'm not going to go into third parties, although there are some great third party tools out there for, for doing SharePoint, HA and DR. The, with the, the session would be all day long if we had to go into everything. So we're going to look at out-of-the-box features fundamentally. We'll talk a little bit about Office Web Apps and a little bit about Workflow Manager. Again, subjects and topics we could talk about for a long time. So I'm going to cover off some of the very basics of those in terms of HA and, and uh, DR. Obviously, from a SharePoint perspective, we're going to talk about SharePoint high availability. We're going to look at things like SharePoint warm standbys, cold standbys, the concept of what we call the hot standby, and what those things actually mean, and what they actually have, what you have to implement in order to make that, uh, in order to gain that functionality in your environment. But the key message is, certainly the key message I want all of you to take away today is, BCM is important. A lot of IT companies spend up to 40% of their IT infrastructure or their IT budgets on back backup and recovery. Sounds like a lot of you don't. But anyway, we'll, I'll, I'll stop harping on about that. Obviously, questions, we do have a lot of interesting swag. Um, seems like the robots are quite popular. Um, and I do have a good question later. Um, so listen in. Um, that will be the robot question. So takeaways. Understand the concepts of business continuity management and the implications for SharePoint. That's the key thing. We're really interested in what, what, what we get for SharePoint here. Differentiate between HA and DR. They are different. There is no real solution that can offer you both at the same time. You always have to implement at least two things. And then to try and gain a little bit of a deeper understanding, what options do we have available? Um, what techniques do we have? Where, what, what's going to cost us more money? What's going to cost us less money? Where's our maximum bang for buck in terms of what we can do from a SharePoint perspective? And I've got some 
kind of interesting demos later. Um, I've got three demos in this session. One's fairly basic. Two involve a lot of machine configuration in SQL, and they have a habit of going wrong. We've got about a 50% hit rate today in this room with good demos versus ones that have collapsed. Hopefully, mine will all be good. They work fine this morning, anyway. So definitions, HA. And I'll, I won't read this out, but fundamentally, the key things you're looking at here is it's a system design approach. It's a service implementation. So we're looking at high availability in the, in, in the various layers of SharePoint, or in, in our case, SharePoint. So at the web application layer, at the service application layer, at the database layer. We need to provide ability for any of those, function, any of those functions to, soft, to recover from a failure. So it, things like load balancers, they give us high availability at a certain level. SharePoint offers us a degree of high availability by using its own internal topology management services where we can offer high availability amongst the service applications. The SQL Server layer, that's where we're going to concentrate a lot on today in terms of how do I make my databases highly available. I'm going to focus mainly on ContentDB because it's the easiest one to work with and demos tend to go better that way. And I don't really talk too much about the service application databases, although feel free to shout questions out. There's a a whole range of topics we could talk about in terms of service applications, especially when we get into things like user profile service applications and search service applications. Those are two particular ones that cause people a lot of pain. And I'm happy to talk about them and take questions. So the key thing about high availability and the things that we're looking to achieve is basically to, to meet our service level agreements. So those of you that have high availability solutions in, in place right now, what kind of SLAs are you aiming for? Three nines, four nines? Anyone? Four nines? So you're trying to achieve four nines? And two nines? So in case you didn't know, Office 365, that's our stated SLA. Three nines. And that means basically the key metric we think about in terms of that is 43.2 minutes per month. Now, if you average that over a year, you know, it comes out to 8.76 hours. That's not a lot of downtime. The key thing to think about is how do I differentiate between planned versus unplanned downtime? If you're in a highly um, commercially sensitive application, it sounds like four nines is probably fairly highly commercially sensitive in that regard, your downtime has to be minimized. That's not the easiest thing to achieve with SharePoint. You know, any of you that have patched SharePoint farms know how painful that can be. And certainly if you're looking at your service level agreement, what does that mean? Is it a service level agreement that just says, I can access my content in a read-only state? That might be fine. That's, what we, that's our service level agreement in Office 365. Is it a service level agreement that says I need read-write read -write capability? I need search services available. I need to be able to update my user profile. All these things go to building a user profile application. Sorry, go to bringing your service level agreement. And it's important to get them right and get them stated, especially if you're a service provider providing a service for someone else. In, in Office 365 dedicated space, if any of you have been involved in those with customers at that, in that scale, this SLA is actually financially backed. If we fail to meet this SLA, the customers don't pay any money. If we breach our SLA by more than five or 10 minutes per month, we pay the customer back. That's the difference between a lot of the service, service providers that we have. You know, we, we, we can have a major data center outage that means we lose all our money for a, mo for a month for all those customers, and that's a significant amount of revenue lost. So it's important to get the SLA right. Defining the SLA defines what you're being held to and what, what redundancy and what capabilities you need to build into your farm in order to meet that SLA. And when we think about the capabilities, we have to think about the th something called fault domains. And um, one of the previous presentations this morning, fault domains came up as a, as a subject. And the key thing is, what am, what am I protecting against? I need to protect against, maybe it's human failure, maybe it's geographic, natural disasters. If I have a tsunami suddenly hit my data center, there's nothing down for that data center, right? The data center's gone. So I need to think of my fault domain as being at the data center level. Yeah, in, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to apologize for keep going on to 365, because it, it is kind of my kind of point of reference. Um, Microsoft have redundant data centers. Anybody that went to Scott Guthrie's session earlier this morning, the redundancy that we have built into our data centers tends to be geographic. So in Europe, for example, all of our customers hosted in Dublin can instantly, well, not instantly, but can fail over within our stated SLA to the Amsterdam data center. In Singapore, Hong Kong. In Arizona to Chicago. So we have this geographic level. So an earthquake would tend to not impact both locations. And that's kind of when we think about the, the data center level. Power outage affect the data center. And then we bring down to you know, the lower levels, like the individual rack. 
Racks have power supplies, they have network connections. We need to think about you know, making sure we have, have redundancy in there. And then down to the, the smaller components, the individual servers, most of you that even don't have, maybe haven't, you know, you stated you don't have HA or DR scenarios, you probably have more than one server in the farm. So you have the ability to implement high availability, even though you may not have done it today. So by having multiple servers, servers having multiple power supplies, multiple network cards, even down to how do you distribute the service applications. So Rich is going to do a session tomorrow morning on SharePoint architecture and design. And he'll talk about service application deployment and where you would deploy the service instances associated with those service applications. And you can think about that in terms of fault domains as well. Having two instances on two different servers in two different racks gives you high availability in different, at different locations. So when we think about, about the fault domains, one of the things to kind of consider is where you're going to place these services. So let's consider we've, we've done our data center design. We've got our two data centers. We're geographically redundant. We've gone to the point of we've got multiple power supplies in there. We have battery backup. We have generators. We have all these kind of things. Well, what about the rack itself? Now, service operations. If any, any, service, any operations guys in here? Girls? No? All consultants and developers? OK. So I'm an ops guy, so I apologize. Um, but from a service operations perspective, the worst possible thing, or one of the worst things you can possibly have, is when a customer comes along and wants to deploy equipment into your data center that doesn't match your standard data center practices. So the racks are all configured different. There's servers here and servers there, and nothing matches, and you can't have, you've got different network switches and different power strips and different power supplies, so there's no redundancy at that level. So you need to consider that when you think about putting racks into data centers. I want all my power strips to be the same, so I just have one supply of redundant, redundant capability. I want all my top of rack routers routers, depending on where you come from, to be the same. Sorry, that's a nightmare in <laughs> Microsoft. That's a whole other discussion. Um, so I want my top of rack routers to be the same, so that if I, one fails, I've got one, one source of spare parts that will work for my entire data center, not having to source from different locations. And this brings into the concept of the concept of the Franken rack, or the, the customized, bespoke, hideous, shoved in the corner of a data center rack that no one can support. So let's think about the rack itself. Inside the rack, we have a power strip. And then the power strip, underneath the power strip, maybe we've got our top of rack router or our switch, network switch, for connectivity for our servers. We then go and drop our boxes in. That's looking fairly good so far. But what's missing? What do we not have in this rack? So UPS is a so redundant power. OK, we have no redundant power supply, which is a key thing. UPS may not necessarily be in the rack. It could be somewhere else. But there is, there is no, there's no redundant feed. And there's no redundant network connectivity. So if that, if that switch goes out, we lose the whole rack. Okay? We want that. If we're going to think about fault domains, that can't be a problem for us. You know, we can't have the services in that rack taking down our entire farm. We have to have redundancy somewhere else. The Franken rack says, well, no, I'm just going to stick extra power supplies and extra network connections in this individual rack itself. So this is where you get into this concept of bespoke racks bespoke um, services built into these racks that don't match and don't meet the standard requirements that you have in the data center. And then you can go one step further and put a third one in there. It's all still, the problem is, everything's still inside one rack. That one rack may have multiple incoming power supplies, multiple income network connections, but if the rack itself fails, you're offline, basically. So let's think about the fact that when you do this, as I said already, the data center people hate you. I used to hate people that did this to me when I worked at, when I was at CSC. I spent so many so, so long in data centers. This thing used to just drive me nuts. And it's a relatively simple problem to solve. So what we do is we define our rack as the fault domain, and we say, okay, our rack's going to be our fault domain. So we need to make sure we can have high availability at that level. So we have two. Seems like a standard thing to do. Seems like a simple thing when you think about it. The number of people that don't do this is is really beyond count. So let's, let's split our rack up. We have two of them. So now we've got redundant power. We've got redundant network connectivity, effectively, as long as we've also got redundant services in that rack. So what's, what about what's inside the box? So we split our racks up, and we start to think about dropping SharePoint servers into here. They could be virtual. They could be physical. It doesn't really matter. What we're interested in is what these things are here, the individual service applications. So we're not going to move our fault domain away from the rack towards the server or towards the service application. And in this case, we have hands up, redundancy or no? Are we HA or are we not? 
Hands up says we're redundant. Are we highly available? No, okay, good. Don't get prize for that, it was easy. <laughs> okay. So the other thing that's missing, you know, secure store service. We could have dependency on a secure store service application, secure store application, and therefore our services could go offline if we lost this rack. So we fix that by putting the service application over here and maybe some more servers. So it's all about duplication, if you like, is one way to think about it. And we have a number of features available for that. So this is kind of where we think about HA. I'm going to talk about some of the HA technology. Um, when we think about disaster recovery, we're really thinking about my environment may go down. I've lost my high availability solution in my single data center. How do I recover and how do I then switch over to a second data center, switch over to a second location? And really, it's all about making sure that we can recover from the human disaster. Cleaner goes into the data center and unplugs the rack to plug the Hoover in and clean up the data center. Or the natural disaster, so the, the, the earthquake, the tsunami, whatever it might be. Does anyone know the story about the Microsoft data centers, by the way? The two data centers in Seattle? How we built one on one side of a volcano and one on the other? Yeah. You've got lots of volcanoes in this area, right? <laughs> so imagine Mount, Mount, so we were up Mount Eden yesterday, a short story, and yesterday before. So picture, the, picture Mount Eden, and then picture it 21,000 feet high, 14 and a half thousand feet high, which is Mount Rainier in, in Seattle. So we said, okay, well, we're gonna build a primary data center on one side, and we're gonna build a secondary data center on the other side because volcanoes only blow one way, right? They never go both ways. <laughs> it's actually a good, good plan, because in this particular, this is a stratovolcano, and it will, when if it blows, it will blow one way. On the other side of the data center, the other side of the mountain, there's a risk of tsunami. You're not likely to get a volcano and a tsunami at the same time, hopefully not. So we, we've got some, some level of redundancy, plus the geographic thing as well. So that's one of the, one of the things that we do at Microsoft. So it's all about defining your requirements. And the two key metrics that we think about when we're looking at disaster recovery is how long do I need to recover? Or how quickly do I need to get my service back online? Four nines. That's a lot of quick work right, to get that back online. So four nines gives you about five minutes at most to get the system. Hmm? Just access to something, yeah. So recovery point objective. How much data can I afford to lose? And that's where you now start to think about cost. So when my system goes offline, how long is it offline for? And how, when I bring it back online, how much data have I lost? You know, wh how much work? If that's a bank, that's a significant financial investment, potentially. Even online, think about today, online casinos. The amount of money they could lose in five minutes just by not being available is, is crippling. So think about RPO, think about RTO. So if fundamentally, it's, if I've got um, a 60-minute RTO, or sorry, 60 minute RPO and a three hour RTO, how much data can I afford to be down or lose 60 minutes of data as long as I get back online within three hours? Okay, and, I'll, and then the data catches up, basically. So if I'm doing SQL Server log shipping, for example, I'm pushing that data out every hour and I can get back on to that point in time. So it's important to think about the, these two metrics. And the key thing that they come down to is as your RPO and RTO comes down, or time shortens, the cost rises, okay? And it's exponential, okay? In SharePoint terms, in, in Office 365, we use a combination of mirroring and log shipping that we're gonna talk about shortly. And those are relatively inexpensive approaches. And the time windows are in the kind of one hour to 15 minute ratio for recovery. And they're, they're acceptable. They're what our customers are happy with. They're what we can easily achieve. If you come down to a scenario where we're now needing one minute I know Wayne worked with a customer that had a very short requirement for RTO and RPO. So one, one minute recovery from a disaster means you can't rely on DR techniques because they're not quick enough. You have to start thinking about HA techniques in a DR scenario. And we'll come and look at that towards the end of the session. But basically the fundamental thing to think about is the shorter the time, the more expensive it's gonna be. If you're a bank, if you're an online gambling site, you can probably afford to implement a lot of decent technology to make this happen. If you're a job logs down the road, an engineering company, don't have a lot of money, but you need access to your content relatively quickly, you need to lessen the requirement and make it more like 15 minutes or more like 30 minutes. It becomes much cheaper in that, in that regard. And then we come on to the good old topic of stretch farms. Has anyone implemented stretch farms with SharePoint? Two, three, 
Okay. Did anybody want to but didn't because the guidelines said you couldn't? <laughs> a few more. Okay. So stretch farms effectively are when we're talking about a scenario where we stretch a number of SharePoint servers and our database servers across a logical barrier or a log across a logical data center. So it could be, for example, in this building and maybe in the conference center over the road. We consider that a logical data center if the network links between the two were sufficient to hit our sub one millisecond network latency requirement. And that means that we can effectively count this as a single data center and therefore effectively use HA techniques to almost get us towards where we're thinking about DR strategy. Because if we lose one, if, we, if this building blew up, now let's think about if that building blew up, then we're okay over here and our, our users in the rest of the world can connect to us and we've got all the redundant services we need in this building. And between the two, while, time, while the, both sides were up, we were constantly replicating our data or mirroring or log shipping our data, whatever techniques we might use. Now, in terms of the stretch farms, we originally stated we were not supported into SharePoint 2013. And to be honest, I'd wish it was still the case. Um, we do now, however, say that we will support stretch farm scenarios. There's a lot of customers out there that assume we would do. And when we didn't, it caused us a lot of problems. It caused a lot of problems from our own consultants saying, this is crazy, we need to do this. We need to be able to support stretch farm configurations. Now, there is a requirement, and the requirement is intra-farm latency of less than one millisecond. So who can tell me how you measure intra-farm latency? And you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> how do I measure the latency between my SharePoint server and my database server? Any guesses? So ping, ping. Most people say ping, right? Because ping tells me what? Round trip time between two machines. What it doesn't tell me is, is that machine responding to my request, though? So I need to think about that as well. So another tool you could look at is TCP ping, which will then open the port on the database server and get you another metric. In fact, what we do is we're, we're still trying to formulate this because when people ask for guidance on how to do this, most people in the field say ping. I've got ping, some millisecond, it's fine. But it doesn't tell the whole story. So we need something that tells us the whole story. So what we're trying to do, and this is not yet fully defined, because I'm here and not at home doing my regular job, is to use this thing. So if you, SharePoint 2010 doesn't have this functionality. So if any of you are still in 2010, you need to wait for 2013 before you can do this. But SharePoint 2013 has this concept of what we call a SQL latency usage provider. And what that basically, what that basically does is, when you enable this feature, or this, this provider, it's part of the usage data collection providers, it effectively tells or issues a task for every server in the farm to connect to every database associated to the farm every five seconds and measure the latency. And it does a simple select one. So those of you that know SQL, a select one is not really doing any querying on the, on the database itself. It's just basically saying, are you alive? It's almost like a ping for SQL. And we measure those values in milliseconds, and we record them in the usage data, SQL, WSS logging database. And that means we can then use those, that information, hopefully, to say, well, if your values are between a certain range, you're good for WCM. If they're lower than this, then you're great for search. If they're higher than that, then search, forget search is not going to work very well. Forget WCM. We want to try and build a matrix of what, it, what these numbers mean in different scenarios. And we're also trying to build it in terms of how does it work in virtualized environments? You know, virtualization, virtualizing a SharePoint platform builds in network latency that you, that's measured inside the virtual stack. So we need to include that as well. So therefore, it's relevant for Azure. So any of you thinking about using AIS in Azure, this becomes important. On-premises, it's important. Anything virtualized, Office 365, that's our problem. But anything else, um, it becomes important. And the kind of data we get, let me show you the data that we get, if I can work this thing. Can I work this thing? My machine comes alive. Hopefully. This is a little bit stylized. But this is kind of shows you what I've done is I've just, in Excel, I've just grabbed an extract from the WSS database. And basically, the numbers that we're interested in are the ones you can't see. Great. <laughs> So let me start from this side. So we can see we have a log time, we have a machine name, which is our SharePoint server. We have data source, which is our SQL server. We have an initial catalog, same as a connection string, initial catalog, so that's the individual database. 
counts is how many tests have been done. Start time and end time for those tests. And if you, do, if you do a diff between them, you'll see it's about every five seconds we're doing a count. And then these numbers over here become important. So in this particular, and I grabbed this data because this is a particular bad one. That's 13 seconds of latency between a SharePoint server that happens to be running central admin and the, and the config DB. So this is a particular poor example. However, it's not quite as bad as it seems because the, number, the percentile value here of three tells me that only three values were within the 99th percentile of this number. Therefore, the other 174 values were lower than that, and they don't even reach the 50th percentile, so they were way lower than that. So we're good. And all the, we're hoping to produce guidance on how to measure this and how to effectively use this data to measure how well your farms are performing and what kind of functionality, what kind of functionality you should be able to support. And you can see as we go down, in fact, let me do a very simple thing. If I just zoom in on one particular database from one particular machine, so if I just go to, I'll use that one because it gives us the bad value. And if I go to config DB, and then a particular time range, so if I look at August, and just one time slot. If this thing refresh, there we go. So you can see we've kind of zoomed down now into a particular database server, a particular application server, and a particular database. So we can zoom in and find out where our problems are. So if, one, if someone complains about having some performance issues, I can use this data to track whether SharePoint detected performance issues as well. Now, I don't want to get too much hang on, hung, up, hung up on this, but this is going to form, hopefully, the basis of some documentation and white papers on guidance around measuring your inter-farm latency and measuring the performance of your farms. So it gets important from a HA perspective later on. So back to the slides. So what about technologies then? And most of you will be very familiar with these. Database failover clustering, database mirroring, log shipping. This is a real design that me and Wayne did in a pub in London back in April. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking, am I? <laughs> it's real, right? This is, we were planning demos and things, so this is kind of what we were planning on doing. So here's our farm one, here's our farm two. We've got synchronous mirroring down here. We've got asynchronous mirroring across here, or asynchronous something across there. And it builds us our HA, and it builds us our DR strategy. So that's kind of a valid design, even though it looks like my three-year-old drew it. So let's look at the technologies. Failover clustering is probably... The old, one of the oldest SQL Server highly available solutions, and probably very common in most of your environments today. I know a lot of DBAs who won't deviate from this because it's what they know, it's what they're practiced with, it's what, they're, what they're, they're very familiar with, and they can literally do failover clustering in their sleep. But it does have its problems. There is a scenario, or there is a situation in the fact that we're using a shared disk subsystem. So what if the disk system fails? It's a single point of failure in a SQL cluster. Right, we need to get that data somewhere else for high availability. So it gives us a local point of contact for high availability, but it does have that, fail, that, that failure. And also from a clustering perspective, if we fail over, we're failing over everything. So we go from one node to the other. There's no sharing of resources unless we build multiple instances in. So we're very much limited to the fact that we have to be able to run, our, if we've got a single cluster, we have to be able to run our entire SharePoint infrastructure on one. In reality, you probably have more, but you get the, you get the idea. So there is, a, there is a risk with clustering. Database mirroring, there's two different types. So the first one we're going to look at is synchronous. Uh, anyone use synchronous mirroring for HA? Oh, well, I didn't ask the original question. Who's clustering? Two, three, or a few. And mirroring? Just at the, at the same site. Yeah, local HA. Okay, so we're going to come on to that geographic type scenarios in a bit, but yeah, H so SQL local synchronous mirroring is certainly what we use in Office 365. So there's, Office 365 consists of potentially hundreds of SharePoint farms, and we use local SQL server mirroring for our HA solution, and it's very effective for SharePoint. Failover time is almost instant. Um, it's, ex it's an exceptionally easy thing to, to create. Um, one of the beauties of the synchronous mirroring scenario is if we look at the, the flow, when we, on our SharePoint server, then um, basically issues a query against SQL to say, get me some data, or makes a save. It could be a save, it could be a request. 
that transaction is replicated across to the mirror server on the far side, and it has to be hardened into the log on that server before the acknowledgement comes back to say, yes, we're done. So before this, the SharePoint box receives an acknowledgement that that transaction's complete, you know for a fact that you've preserved your data on this far side. So from a high availability solution, it's almost perfect. Does, does that work um, across data centers as well? Mm, there you're running into your latency issues, right? So there is stories. There is, an answer, there is a potential answer to that, which we're going to get onto shortly. So a couple of advantages of this. It's mirrored as part of a transaction. So the transaction fails, the whole thing rolls back. SharePoint's, you know, you, get, you get, might get a hideous error message, but in terms of transactional integrity for the data, you're fine. And we have a, other things like compressed log stream for transmitting the data. We have the concept of auto page repair in this scenario. So if this SQL server detects it's got a, a corruption in the database on this side, it can actually go over to this side and say, have you got an, an uncorrupt version? And pull that data across. So it can almost protect itself in some regards. It's not something you should rely on, but it's a, it's a capability. And then we have asynchronous. And this is where asynchronous comes into where we think about distance is not a barrier. But there are downtime. It isn't really a HA solution. It's more of a DR strategy. With, sorry, with asynchronous, what we're really looking at is when we make our transaction, we commit back to SharePoint before we really know what's happened to that transaction. So it's basically fire and forget. And if you're in the military, you used to fire and forget missiles, kind of shoot them over the horizon and don't forget where it goes to, American style. That's, <laughs> sorry. I can't do this presentation in America. They don't like it. Um, so basically what we do is we, the, the transaction goes across to the, to the secondary SQL server, but the first SQL server acknowledges back to SharePoint. It doesn't wait for an acknowledgement. If it doesn't get an acknowledgement back, it will, it will record an error. Right? It's not like it's not going to do anything if it doesn't fail, but it's not transactionally. Um, there's no transactional integrity. So if it fails, SharePoint's going to get acknowledged and it's just going to carry on. So if you're doing loads of database, up, loads of document uploads, for example, SharePoint's just going to carry on. Eventually, SQL will log an error. So it records back. So this, the scenario here is, because we're not waiting for that request to come back before we get knowledge to SharePoint, we can live with distance. So this gives you an ability to go north to South Island, to go potentially cross geographic boundaries. So east to West America can be done with this scenario, with this, capability, with this um, technology. But it does have the risk of the lack of transactional integrity means you have to flag the potential for data loss. So you don't, know, you don't really know what's happened to it. So the question was, can, is the data loss only at the point where you fail over? Was that the key question? So the key thing with database mirroring is you have this concept of what we call the redo log. And the redo log is basically the list of transactions that haven't yet been committed. So that redo log is your list of potential data loss. So if you failed over from one to the other and your transactions hadn't been fully committed on the far side, you'll get a rollback. So transactions that were originally committed here may well roll back over here because they were never received. So that's how you, there's a potential data loss. How big that redo log is depends on how busy SQL, SQL is, to be honest. It's not mirroring in, mirroring in terms of um, frequency of updates doesn't really have, not to my knowledge anyway, an easy way, if any way, to configure the replication time. I don't, I don't, so, so you're very much hostage to fortune. Yeah? If your SharePoint server is very quiet, there's not a lot of traffic going on, and you have a failover in the middle of the night, chances are you're not going to lose anything. If it's in the middle of a really busy day and loads of transactions going on, your redo log is going to be bigger, therefore there's a risk you'll lose more data. Did that answer the question? Okay, thank you. So summary, database mirroring, cost effective. It's cost effective because unlike failover clusters, we don't have to have a reliance on having the identical hardware on both sides of the cluster. You know, the clusters typically go through this hardware check that says you must be compliant with this and you must be compliant with that. You need the same driver versions on both sides of the cluster. You need the same updates on both sides. Mirroring, we don't really care. You can have a super high power HP G6 server on one side of the mirror and you could have a tiny little desktop on the other. Mirroring doesn't care. Okay, you're going to run into latency issues and performance issues, but from a configuration perspective, it's going to work fine. So you can have cheaper hardware 
on the mirrored side, yeah, use your older hardware over there because it's just DR in an asynchronous scenario. If it's, if it's mirroring for high availability, the chances are you're going to have the same hardware anyway because you, you may fail over more frequently. Nice and easy to set up. Very easy to set up indeed. Um, it's so easy, I'm not going to demo it. So, because it is that easy, I'm going to demo something harder <laughs> that might work. Um, it also works at the database level. So, we're from a mirroring perspective, each database has its own mirroring connection. So, we can fail over individual databases. And that gives us an advantage in that we can then leverage both sides of the, of the cluster, if you like, or both sides of the mirrored relationship for compute power. I can have certain databases running on one side, certain databases running on the other side, live both taking connections from SharePoint. And if one database fails over, I don't need to think about all of them failing over and having to support my entire compute on one side. In practice, you would, because there is a potential that you may fail everything over at one go. But in reality, you can leverage the power of both sides of the SQL relationship at the same time. Hiccup while it fails over, yes. There will be a slight blip. Really, it depends how big the redo log is. It depends how big the databases are. It depends how many of them you fail over at once and how powerful SQL is. Um, I've seen it take a few seconds. I've seen it take almost instant. And I've seen it take hours if you're in the middle of a massive transactional rollback. For example, if you fail over a crawl database in the middle of a crawl, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So, but typically, from content perspective, things you're concerned about from an SLA perspective, it's very quick, very, very quick. And applications are mirror aware. So SharePoint's mirror aware, very easy using the .NET connection string to make any of, any of your custom applications mirror aware as well. So it's very straightforward. And then log shipping is the old favorite. Log shipping is predominantly what Microsoft uses for DR. We don't use asynchronous mirroring. We use log shipping. Um, in Office 365, we run log shipping with about a 15-minute time window on it. Um, so we basically take a transaction log back up every 15 minutes and ship it across. Or well, we drop it on a share, it gets replicated across to another part of the globe, and then we roll it back onto our databases on the other side. So effectively what happens with log shipping is we, SharePoint commits its transaction to SQL. SQL, com or should I say, SQL commits its transaction to disk. And then after a defined period, by default 15 minutes, could be whatever you, whatever you like, um, no, it doesn't like, take 15 minutes to commit back. That's faux pas. Um, it commits back. But then once you've got your data hardened down here, there's a transaction log backup that takes place. We drop transaction logs onto a high-speed um, distributed file system, rep, file system uh, replication DFS, DFSR share. And they replicate from one side of the country to the other in America very, very quickly. We, we, our data rates are huge, like 40 gig a minute. They're pretty, pretty big. Um, and we can, one of the advantages of, of log shipping is we can replicate to multiple secondaries. So if I wanted to go to a three data center scenario, I can have replication using log shipping to one data center and to log shipping to another data center. I could use asynchronous mirroring for some of that as well. But typically log shipping is your kind of de facto standard, the one everybody uses, the one that's very robust and resilient and just works. Right? It involves a little bit of work on the other side. Configuring it is a little bit more work. Um, failing over isn't automatic because your databases are always are all restoring on the far side of the of the, the log shipped. Basically, these transactions are constantly being replayed over here, so there is some work to do when you fail over in this scenario. So hence, it's not a HA solution, but it is a fantastic DR solution. As long as your recovery on this side, you can get these databases online within your SLA, and that's the key thing. Office 365 for our SLA, dead easy. PowerShell scripts just make it happen. We can fail over an entire dedicated Office 365 instance with about 100 terabytes of data in under 15 minutes. It's all automated. So it's, um, log shipping is traditionally what Microsoft have always, we've always used. Um, and in the Office 365 dedicated space, we use this. Um, one of the key things was the ability to do multiple replicas. So we have, at any one point in time inside Microsoft Office 365 dedicated, there's at least six copies of the customer data in various stages of SQL. And log shipping gives us what, so we use mirroring for local H high availability, but we use log shipping for shipping it across geographic. It's, it, it's a, again, it comes down to the, something the DBAs are more familiar with. Yeah, so it's something that we know and it works. Um, going forward, we're gonna look at another technology, which is, eight, which is SQL Server always on availability groups. You know, the new, the new guy in the, in, the, in the park, so to speak. Um, in Office 365 multi-tenant, 
we use a customized version of log shipping, which is PowerShell driven and script driven. It doesn't use latent SQL technology. So we put it all together, think about what we can do, and this is just one scenario. I'll just build this thing right out. So for HA, local HA failover cluster. For local HA again, we're mirroring to another cluster. So this is where we think about things like what's your downtime requirements and what's your RTO and RPO. You're spending a lot of money at this point. This could equally be one SQL server and one SQL server with mirrored HA between. Instead, we've gone to a more extreme case of failover cluster, mirroring failover cluster, and then we've got our log shipping configuration down the bottom, which gives us our geographic redundancy or our second data center redundancy. So this is just one option. There's a whole range of things you can do here. And generally, there's also questions about, you know, what am I talking about from a database perspective? Am I referring to content databases or service application databases? Because the story changes, depending on what you're doing. It's a too big a sub subject for this, because we'll be here all night. Um, but I'm happy to talk about it later, if you wish, or ask questions at the end. The next guy in the, in the, in the or the new, the new guy on the block, if you like, is this concept of SQL Server Always On. Is anybody using this right now? So there's more people using SQL Server Always On availability than they didn't have a BCM strategy. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> Testing it or using it in, in, in ADA. So Always On availability groups give us this kind of hybrid, if you like, scenario or hybrid technology between not quite clustering, not quite mirroring, and really not quite log shipping. It's somewhere in between. And it uses bits and pieces of all those technologies. So mirroring, if you might, you should be aware of, SQL Server mirroring is actually going to be gone in the next version of SQL. Okay, you will not be able to do SQL Server mirroring in SQL Server 2014, whatever it is. Deprecated, but we don't want to use it. We don't really want to use it today if we can avoid it, because we've got this guy. And this guy gives us an option to create multiple replicas of our data Behind the scenes, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to try and build this for you in the demo, and this should work fine, hopefully. Um, the, behind the scenes, what we're basically doing here is we're creating a, a, a Windows cluster, and on the Windows cluster, we sit SQL Server. Well, that's no different from having a SQL cluster, right? Except it is, because we're not building SQL in a clustered state. SQL doesn't become a clustered resource anymore. We basically sit it on top of the Windows cluster to take advantage of the clustering services that we get with, with that capability. But SQL Server itself are effectively discrete instances until you connect them together by creating what we call an always-on availability group. And at that point, we can then replicate our SQL databases across that group using a number of different styles of, commit, of committal. We can do synchronous commit, which is equivalent to our HA scenario synchronous mirroring capability. Or we can do async commit, which is, again, equivalent to our uh, asynchronous mirroring capability. And then you might equally do log shipping as well as this. So for high availability, synchronous commit. For DR, asynchronous commit, with one caveat. Asynchronous commit is currently only supported for content DBs. So if any of you are using this for SharePoint today and doing asynchronous replication of service application databases, it is not supported. Anyone, anyone doing it? Good. It might work, and we should know by the end of this year whether we're going to officially support it. But for now, it's content DBs only. So bringing them all together, I'm going to come on to that again in a few minutes, but bringing it all together in terms of our um, requirements, so RPO and RTO options, recovery time objective, recovery point objective. If we build this out into what our capabilities are, what we're really saying here is short time recovery times, short recovery points, always on synchronization, mirroring in synchronous state, failover clustering, depending on, how, on what's failed, um, can also be quick. So the quicker technologies are down the bottom. Failover clustering, if you lose your storage, you're then into a different whole scenario. If you lose one side of the cluster, then it's a very quick failover. If you lose your storage, you're then potentially into a backup to store scenario. So these are the kind of options we have. It depends on, you know, here you're looking at expensive, Potentially expensive, should we say? As you move further out, cheaper. Um, again, potentially cheaper, but depending on what you build, depending on how you do it. And then when we look at some of the other technologies, so I'm going to spend a very brief time on this. I need to speed up and get my demos done. So um, in terms of the Office Web App Farm, for Office Web Apps, very simple. They're effectively stateless, 
We've got an expert sat at the front if you've got any difficult questions. Um, nothing's really persisted in an Office Web App Farm. The only thing we have is a configuration kind of XML document that really um, is, is replicated around the farm in terms of what the configuration of the farm is. But fundamentally, it's a very simple scenario. So if you need to do disaster recovery for Office Web Apps, you just disconnect the SharePoint farm from the broken, broken Office Web Apps farm, and you reconnect it to, the, to a working one. And the working one could be a local standby, it could be a remote standby. And the only, scenario, the only problem you'll get if it's a remote one is potential latency issue. I don't believe we have a support statement that says your web app farm can't be at a certain distance from your, from your SharePoint farm. But it's a relatively simple thing to recover from. Workflow manager farms, on the other hand, um, somewhat more complex. So we all know the scenario with one versus three and the Monty Python statement of you know, three shall be the number of the counting and the number of the counting shall be three. No, I'm not going to embarrass myself further than by going into that one. <laughs> Look up the holy, holy hand grenade of Antioch on Wikipedia. Um, from a workflow management perspective, disaster recovery is quite painful. There's a number of databases, at least six databases you might have to recover to build, rebuild out your workflow manager farm. So it's a very complex scenario. And depending on what fails, do my databases fail or do my servers fail? Whichever, whichever one fails gives you an, an equally complex scenario to recover it. So it isn't simple, and it's a session in itself. Fundamentally, you restore the databases, and you rebuild a farm using those databases. That's probably the easiest and quickest way to recover. But it can be quite complex. That's enough about those. So anyway, hot standby. This is kind of someone mentioned about the concept of having a hot standby farm and a very low RTO. Hot standbys typically use, oh, we'll go back to that, hot, hot standbys typically use high availability techniques to give us a DR scenario. So I would, for example, build in a, because we're using high availability techniques, we have to have our single logical data center. The official support statement is it must be in the same building as the production farm. So production and DR must be in the same physical building which typically means the same data center. And we use HA scenarios. So we, do, we use HA technologies such as SQL synchronous mirroring to another farm. So we're not going local now. We're still local, sorry, in terms of geography, but we're not going local in terms of the farm. We're not replicating to another SQL instance that's connected to the same farm. We're replicating to another SQL instance that's going to be connected to a different farm, but, lo but, but geographically local. So HA, more expensive techniques. They can give us a much better or much lower RTO, much lower RPO, but more expensive, generally. So, yeah, we've got time. I'm going to do um, a demo in terms of high availability groups, just to talk you through what the demo is going to try and do anyway. It should work fine. My VMs are up, so. I'm going to basically take, this is a start point. So I have a SharePoint farm, which is connected to SQL, and is serving a simple site collection. I have a second SQL server, and what I'm going to do is convert this into an always-on availability group with two SQL servers with replication in between, synchronous replication, because it's high availability we want to achieve. And then I'm going to quickly um, drop, I'm going to reconnect the database. I'm going to disconnect it from the SQL instance and reconnect it to the always-on availability group. So basically switch the connection string. And I'm going to do it very simply, just going to drop the content DB and reconnect it. And then I'm going to fail it over. And that's when we'll find out if the demo really works. So. Let's see, what we, let's see what happens. So, okay, we have here um, SharePoint Farm 1, which hopefully this will all be fine, is serving this SharePoint, this, this site collection here, nice and simple. Um, and I have SQL Server 1, SQL Server 2. Now, there's a number of dependencies for always on availability groups. I said already we need to have a Windows cluster. I'm not going to go and install a Windows cluster because it, it would just take too long. It would be the end of the demo. What, I, what I've already built out is a Windows cluster, which you can see here. Now, I've added three servers to it because the third server is for the next demo. But I'm interested in these two right now. So these are in the cluster. And it's a simple cluster. I haven't, got any, I haven't done anything clever with um, quorums or having proper, you know, I wouldn't build it quite like this if I was doing it for real, but it's, it's enough to demonstrate this technology. In terms of creating an always-on availability group, there's a number of requirements. First of all, the database that I'm going to host in that group must have been backed up recently, so I can then use it as a seed for my target location. So I'm going to use this database here. This is the database that hosts my, um, my site collection. And I'm going to just very quickly overwrite what I have now. 
just so I know it's going to get done. And I'll just quickly back that up. That should be nice and quick. That's done. And then in terms of creating an always on availability group, things are really quite simple. It's wizard driven. A couple of things you need to do before you do this. Inside SQL Configuration Manager, and I've done all this already. Hopefully this will load quickly. Your SQL Server services, you must have set them here to be part of an available cluster name. So basically, the one, it detects that, the, that it's been installed on a, on a Windows cluster. It reads the cluster name automatically, and you tick the box and then restart the services. In mine and other people's experience, restarting the services twice tends to be a good idea. Okay? <laughs> That's one for the demo gods to rem remember. Anyway, okay, coming back to this. So in terms of creating availability groups, so there's a wizard. Right? You can do all this through PowerShell. You don't need to do it through the wizard, but for the sake of ease of ease of ease of um, and, and a description, I'll go through the wizard. So next, I'll give it a name, and I'm going to call it something I haven't used before, so I don't break DNS. And we can see here the databases that I can add to this group. As you see here, these are saying this is this needs to be in full recovery mode, so I can't add that because it doesn't meet the requirements. The one I'm interested in here is meet prerequisites, which is Internet Content 01, so I can add that in. And then I can start adding in my, my replicas. So nice and easy, I can add a replica here, and I'm going to add SQL 2. I need to authenticate, so I've got SQL 1 and SQL 2, primary and secondary. And depending on what I configure here depends on what the functionality of that and what the capabilities are going to be. In this case, I want synchronous commit, because I want this to be equivalent to a HA scenario with synchronous replication. Other things we have in here, such as endpoints, are really just talking about how SQL is going to make the the two endpoint connections available so that they can talk to each other effectively for replication. This port number is critical. Think about your firewalls, 5022. Make sure that's open. Make sure the SQL servers can talk to each other across that port. If they don't, you can't form an availability group and you'll get an error in the wizard. Other things we can do, such as backup preferences and listener, I'm going to come on to in a minute. Backup preferences really allow us to say, of all the, all the replicas inside my rec replication group, which one am I going to use as my backup target? So I can take my backup away from my production database, if you like. So I back up a database that's, that really isn't being used by end users, just for performance reasons. As a listener, I can create an availability listener. I'm going to come back to that in just in a minute. I'm, con I'm conscious of time right now. Question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have to call this out. Sorry, Wayne. Read readable secondary. So this pe the people saw this in SharePoint World and thought, awesome. I can have a replica now that I can connect to SharePoint Farm to and read, just in read-only mode. Okay? Yes, it does work to a degree. No, it isn't supported. Right? <laughs> Hopefully it isn't supported yet. Time will tell. Um, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a great feature. Um, great for your own applications, but from a SharePoint perspective, we don't support you right now doing that. Could be useful as a reporting target, though, potentially. We need a share to which the SQL Server accounts have access to in order to do the transaction, in order to do the initial database seeding and then we do the transaction log shipping piece. And the options we have are full, join or skip. If I do full, then the wizard will take care of copying the backup to the other server and doing the restore on the other server and setting up all the connectivity. If I do a join only, then I need to have done that restore of the target database on the other server already. And if I do skip data synchronization, it's basically saying, I'm going to do all that work myself, all of it. So the easiest thing to do is full, because then it just does everything for you. You get a little wizard, just make sure, does a bunch of checks to make sure everything's good. I get an error on listener, because I, I, haven't, built, I haven't asked to do a listener. So if, if the diagram I had on the screen before, the listener is going to become my, effectively my SQL server name, if you like, that, rep, that represents the whole cluster. And I'm going to do that in a minute, just because there's another wizard for it that, that's worth seeing. I'll finish. This should be nice and quick. So it pulls the full backup over. We should see this start to appear over here on SQL 2, eventually. There we go. And it's in a restoring state. Those of you familiar with mirroring would recognize that as a state that you get from a mirroring, a mirrored database. Let's go back to SQL 1, and it's done. If you don't have the firewall open, the error message you'll get is down here on this last line. It'll sit there saying, join in cluster, and just spin until eventually it times out. 
That's a classic that you haven't got the, fi the firewall configured correctly. So we can close that. And I have my cluster. I have my replicas, primary and secondary. I have a nice little dashboard that shows me the status. And I can see that both these replicas are synchronized. So effectively, anything changes I make in primary are going to get replicated across, and it's all good. In order to make use of that, what I want to do is go to my SharePoint farm, go to my central admin, which hopefully is nice and refreshed. Because I've only got five minutes and this, the next demo is more exciting. And all I want to do here, oh, come on. What I'm basically going to do is take the database that's currently connected to SharePoint. Now, if you imagine this was a real failover scenario, I wouldn't be connecting it using the UI. I'd be using scripts, or I'd be configuring the whole thing through scripts. So all I want to do here is basically say, remove, OK. And it's gone. If I try to go back to my SPO1 site collection, I should get a nice hideous 404, which is what we'd expect, because we don't have a database. And then I go back, sorry, go back to central admin. I add the database back. I'm going to use the always on availability replica name in this case. And it was intranet, intranet01. And OK. And this should just take a second. He says it's one site collection. It's a 63 meg database. It can't take that long. Here. Come on. How long can it take? <laughs> I should have used PowerShell, right? Was it not the correct name? Really? Did I not use I thought I used tens as the This is what happens. Typical. I should have. What should happen is it hasn't created me a name. Oh, man. This is a nightmare. My replica was called tens. <laughs> I didn't create a listener. Why don't you tell me? Come on. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> yeah, you didn't warn me, though, did you? I mean, come on. All right. <laughs> All right, tens. Port, SQL port, 1433. I want to use a static IP, and I'm going to use 10.10.10. Uh, something I haven't used before. OK, OK. Listener should be created in. There we go. It's coming to life. It's done. I have a replica. I have a listener. So my listener represents now my SQL point where I'm going to connect to SQL Server. So I can go back in here. I can use my database server as tens. I can use intranet. I should use more simple database names. OK. Right, it's added. So I should go back here. And we're back in the business. OK. So thank you for whoever whispered listener in my ear then. Thank you. That was much appreciated. So this is going to work. It's going to fire up and it'll be fine. Um, let me go back to the slides quickly, because I'm not just conscious of your time. And is there coffee break after this? Yeah. Oh, cool. Right. Who wants to hang around? Shh. <laughs> shh, 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 shh. Right. <laughs>
Okay, so that, that's worked. Let me just quickly show you that. That's not fine. Okay, so that's a, basically, we, we, basically what we've done is we've connected to the listener. So we're now using the listener. So if I fail over SQL, I won't do that because I'm going to do that in the next demo if you want to stay. It's up to you. Um, if I failed over the SQL server, SharePoint wouldn't care because the listener will move. Yeah, the cluster manager will take care of moving the listener to point to the right SQL server. Okay, so it's like mirroring in many regards. So, warm standby, subtly different, complex, depends on service applications and databases, I've already said. We, can't, we have to be careful what we do. We can't use warm standby. Some things are not suitable for, for, high, for um, warm standby in terms of DR. There's no point me replicating crawl databases to another farm. They're, they're of no use, right? Any of the, well, mm, so, yeah, some of them can be. Admin DB is useful, right? You'll find that tomorrow in my other session. The, the demos are working. But crawl DB is no use. Um, we don't have a property DB anymore. We can do user profile service application databases. They work fine. You can do those. You can do just about any others. But content DBs also works fine from a warm standby um, or HA perspective using synchronous replication. If you're using um, warm standby over a latent network or high latency network, you need to think about doing log shipping or asynchronous replication. So equally supported, higher risk of data loss. I know. Conscious of your time. The next demo I'm going to do, I will stay and do this because we've got a coffee break if you want to stay for it. Other than that, I'm going to start asking questions. Oh, okay. All right. So this is going to be the last demo. So apologies, I'm not going to do this one for you. I don't have time. What I was going to do, take the clustered resource. Okay. Build it. Take the always on availability group. Still using it for replication. I'm not going to use a listener. Why would I not use a listener if I'm replicating from Auckland to Wellington? Right. You get that, because I've got to dip these out now, because I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay, so what, I'm gonna, what I would do here is, I'm going to replicate from Auckland to Wellington. This is my North Island, no, North Island, North Island, North South thing. In this case, I can't use a listener, because I'm going geographic. If I used a listener over a geographic connection, the chances are that connection's high latency, high latency doesn't work, or I can't use a listener because I could end up being connected to a SQL server in the wrong place. If I stretch that listener connection across there, right, this server could potentially be ended up linked to this database. And that's not allowed because it breaks our stretch farm requirements greater than one millisecond. Really, I need to be local. So what I would do in this scenario is I would do this. I would break, take the, take the, still, still have the cluster there, so I'm still replicating my databases across. So in this case, I'm replicating across three instances. I've got synchronous connection here, local, high availability. I would do an async replica over there. So that gives me my DR location with a risk of data loss. My connection in farm one would be to the SQL name of the servers. So I would use the traditional SQL SharePoint primary and rep failover replica failover instance inside content DB configuration. Here, over there, I would be replicating a content DB to SQL 3 that I could then attach to a DR farm to bring that site back online. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. It, that's going to take time. Wayne's telling me I don't have time to do that demo. But um, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you email me, I'll record this demo for you and I'll make it available, okay? I'll make sure you get it. I'll put it on my SkyDrive. It does work. It works really well. So apologies for not being able to do it. Um, that's the summary. That's going to be in the slides. That's what I would have done. Okay, what I just talked about. So just basically the final thing was cold standby where we're really talking about backup, SharePoint backup, restore, and DPM as a possible solution. DPM doesn't work for service applications, unfortunately. Anyone use DPM? No? Okay. So summary, we've seen all these points. There was a lot of stuff. I apologize. Didn't get a chance to finish it all. Um, Feel free to email me if you wish. And there's a lot of other sessions. So, questions. You're all hanging around for the swag, aren't you? That's what it is. Someone wants that machine. OK, so for this, I have no idea what's in here. Um, how many milliseconds can I limit to my There's a hand up there already. That, the hand went up. I need hands. Sorry, no shouting out. I used to be a school teacher as well. Okay, for the big, the big prize then. Um, the 
big prize, the big prize, the big prize. SQL Server 2012, which, which is the minimum version of SQL Server I need? I haven't mentioned this, so this is kind of someone that knows what they're talking about, to support asynchronous mirroring. That hand came up first. There you go. Have a, have a device. You haven't already got one, have you? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to close it there. I apologies for not being able to finish that demo. Um, like I said, I will record it, so email me. If you have any more questions, feel free to come up. Apologies for eating into your break time. Sorry about that. Thank you.